Okay, so my name is Tracy Paff smith I am the exec Executive Director of the Huntington Historical Society. The Society was founded in 1903 and we work to preserve and share the history of the town of Huntington. If you'll advance the slide, Robert. <clears throat> First, I want to thank the sponsors of today's program, People's United Bank. They were sponsoring our in-person events and have very graciously agreed to sponsor these virtual lunch and learns. They have branches throughout the island and would be happy to assist you with your banking needs. Also want to thank all the members that are on. Membership is an annual contribution starting at $30 for seniors, $40 for individuals, and provides critical, unrestricted support for our education and outreach programs, exhibitions, and the preservation of our properties and collections. Finally, thank you so, so much to everyone who donated when they signed up today. Your support is so, so appreciated, as I'm sure you can imagine, now more than ever. All right, so on to our speakers. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Toby Kassam, who is a trustee of the Society and is involved with several other Huntington-based history organizations. Robert Hughes has served as our town historian for the last 18 years. He is an employee of the town of Huntington and he works closely with the Huntington Historical Society and other local history institutions to preserve and interpret the history of our town. All right, so I will turn it over to you, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, I think, as everyone knows, we're going to talk about Huntington's Winter Carnival, the beginning of the 20th century, from 1907 to 1920. And really, the, the main feature and attraction of the Winter Carnival was uh, the bobsled races. The course, uh, if you're not familiar, um, ran from uh, Carly Avenue and Lawrence Hill down to Woodbury Road, took a little turn and then continued down uh, on Main Street. And the Winter Carnival was kind of an appropriate thing for Huntington at the beginning of the 20th century because it really was the town that loved to have a party. Uh, there were the, the Winter Carnival, of course. The uh, Cross Island Trolley opened in 1909, which was a big parade and party that everyone participated in. A new train station, a new train station opened uh, in 1910 and had uh, direct service for the first time into Penn Station. There were water carnivals at the Chateau Beaux-Arts in Huntington Bay. In the fall, uh, there were pushmobile races, which we'll talk about a little later on. And it really was the, the Hamptons of, of its time. And all the rich and famous who wanted to get out of the heat of the city came out to Huntington uh, for the summer, rented cottages, stayed in hotels, and there was a real sort of party atmosphere, especially in the summer. And the Winter Carnival was a way of keeping that atmosphere going into the um, winter. I just admitted somebody, that was the delay. We have, every, there was a, a program for the Winter Carnival, which had advertising and uh, the committee list. This is the uh, program from 1909. It's not in the best of shape after 111 years, 112 years. Um, but uh, it does give us a lot of interesting background. This is the committee, the different uh, subcommittees that put the Winter Carnival on. And if you look at all those names, some names repeat, but uh, just about anybody who was anybody in Huntington uh, back in the early 20th century was in some way involved on these committees. Uh, there's advertising. Uh, here's the Huntington House which is on the corner or was on the corner of Wall Street and uh, Main Street. Um, the last proprietor starting in 1913 until it was torn down in 1920 was Andrew Finnegan. And the, the sort of the history of Finnegan's extends back to the Huntington House. Uh, and this is the finish line of the race at Wall Street. And I have not found anything to really support this conclusion, but I think, uh, the fact that the finish line was out, outside a bar had something to do with the festivities that the, everyone enjoyed uh, during the carnival. There were other hotels in town. There's the Suffolk Hotel, which was on the opposite side of Main Street on the south side, just before New York Avenue. Uh, the part that survives is right on the corner where the new uh, bakery cafe is on the lopsided building that everyone's familiar with. And here you see a picture of it before they lopped off a third of that building. The rest of that hotel was torn down in 1927. 
Uh, up on Hale site was the Edgewater Hotel. And up on the water was the uh, uh, Beaux-Arts. This is the Casino Beaux-Arts. And right behind it, where this picture is taken from, would have been the Chateau Beaux-Arts, the hotel, which was really the, the height of luxury uh, for the Huntington hotels, more so than the, the hotels in the village. Uh, something that made this uh, carnival possible to some extent was the uh, introduction of utilities in the early 20th century. Uh, the Huntington Gas Company was founded in the 1890s. Huntington Light and Power was started in 1902. And uh, some of the people who were involved with that are the Willets, and we'll talk about them a little bit later on. The two companies merged in 1905. And of course, there was also the Huntington Water Works, which was important for providing the water to ice down the course to give them a little extra slipperiness that the snow couldn't necessarily provide. Uh, as we go through the photographs from the Winter Carnival, we see a lot of photographs that uh, say Feather Photos or Feather Did It. So this is an advertisement from James Feather and his studio. The other photographer in town was Lockwood and his uh, store or his location is right here. It's Lockwood uh, Photographers on the second floor uh, of that building on the north side of Main Street. I mentioned the new train station. Here there's a little advertisement included in the brochure talking about the uh, station is currently being erected and that would open later in uh, the year. The pushmobile races that we talked about, these were held in the fall, uh, kind of a maybe a little bit of a tune-up to some extent for the winter carnival, although it's completely different craft. But uh, these were uh, something that the, the teenagers would create and try to see who had the fastest one. And these are a couple of interesting articles that talk about how important the pushmobile races were. They were popular places, but also that it was good for encouraging originality and ingenuity in students. And students would you know, spend a lot of their uh, free time improving their, their pushmobiles and their sleds uh, to make them go faster. And that's really hands-on learning which I, I don't think we really have anymore. So we've lost a little bit of that uh, ingenuity that uh, kids used to have. Here's the course again. As I said before, it starts up on Carley Avenue in Lawrence Hill, which at the time was called West Main Street. Uh, that was really the straight shot was Lawrence Hill down to uh, Main Street. And what we now call uh, Main Street to, uh, 25A off to the right uh, was more of a, a, left, a right hand turn. Uh, so the, the straightaway was uh, Lawrence Hill Road. Um, they would pass uh, St. Patrick's Church, and Toby's going to talk about the corner here at Woodbury, where the little bit of a turn was, which is a dangerous uh, area. Here's Clinton Street, and then Wall Street, where the timed finish line was, then New York Avenue, and here's the library in the Soldiers and Sailors building. There were two different categories during the race. There was uh, the timed, whoever could get to Wall Street the fastest, and then there was the fetch whoever could go furthest with their sled. And typically they would get as far as the Soldiers and Sailors building and sometimes even a little further. Now the Huntington Historical Society has long collected some of these bobsleds. Uh, in recent years, the collection has grown uh, in very important ways. This is the piping rock, which was out of Locust Valley. Here's an exhibit from uh, 1976. Uh, somebody sarcastically said it was a dynamic exhibit. I don't know who that person was, but uh, it was me. It doesn't look like a very exciting exhibit just to have four sleds here on the lawn. Uh, I'm sure there was more to it, but this is probably the piping rock, the white sled uh, right here, the piping rock that we saw before. One of the more recent acquisitions is the Samus family bobsled. Here it is in, 19, in the 1950s on Prospect Street. Now, the bobsled, as we'll see later on, as you saw in the previous pictures, were long logs basically that were finished uh, and they were resting on these beddies. One in the back you would clip on and that would stay uh, stationary. The one in the front swiveled to turn the sled. Here's one that the beddy was made uh, in 1894. So you can see the bobsledding predated the winter carnival by, uh, by a couple of decades. There were bobsleds also in Oyster Bay, uh, probably some other towns around. Uh, so people rode the circuit a little bit with their bobsleds. Here are the, um, some of the sleds in the Kassam barn in a previous exhibit. And you see the, these are the, the Bettys from the Mary, which gets a little confusing if you have Bettys on a Mary. 
Uh, but Toby will talk about the Mary a little later on. Uh, and here, these are not Bettys, these are single sleds. Uh, and Toby will be talking about those as well. Because it wasn't just the big bobsleds that had up to 25 people on them. Uh, there were uh, heats for single sleds as well. Here's the Northport uh, bobsled. And here are the Huntington bobsledders. Uh, it's not a great picture. This is in front of the Methodist Church, which was on the corner of uh, Clinton and Main Street. Uh, and if you see the sled in front, it, it says Huntington on the sled. Here's the Huntington again with the men. men. And then you see uh, Feather's photo over here. And if you get a close up of right here, it was built by M.R. Fagan, uh, who was a builder who worked for uh, Cantrell uh, carriage makers. So here it is, bobsled builder with Can oh, Joseph Cantrell. Cantrell, of course, is the innovator of the wood-sided depot wagon uh, that was first built in Huntington Village and then moved down to Huntington Station. Now, the story of the Huntington is interesting. Um, it was built by the McCowan brothers, owned by the McCowan, built by Fagan for the McCowan brothers. The McCowan brothers had a dairy farm on Woodbury Road, uh, between Woodbury Road and Woodchuck Hollow. Today, there's a road called Snowball Drive that runs through their farm. Uh, after the last uh, winter carnival in 1920, the McCowan brothers apparently put their bobsled up in a barn and forgot about it for 80 years uh, until the current owners of that property, uh, the D'Amelia family, who's lived there since 1960, decided to renovate the barn. They took the, the bobsled out to get it out of the way. Um, and then a few years later approached uh, Tom Hogan, who is this gentleman here who runs the Colston Harbor Firehouse Museum and asked if he'd be interested. Tom said, no, you should really give it to the Huntington Historical Society. So we went over and picked it up. This is in 2011. Uh, as you can see, these are long and heavy and it took quite a few men to, uh, to carry it. And here is Mr. D'Amelio, the owner, donating uh, the sled to the Huntington Historical Society. And as you can see, uh, it really got worn away. Some of the uh, slats on the sides were broken and the paint had faded considerably, but you can still make out a little bit of the detailing and some of the lettering. Uh, the Historical Society hired Anna Dam Folk to uh, restore it. She's uh, an artist. She's done quite a few uh, paintings of Cold Spring Harbor Village that you may be familiar with, watercolors of uh, the streetscape there. So she came and uh, stenciled the remaining letters to recreate what was there and spent a lot of time just doing uh, a very particular job on getting it with the right kind of paint and re-erecting re uh, that uh, the name and the decorations on the sled. And here you can see it after she was done. And we moved it out of the barn, across the lawn and into the sheep shed uh, at the Kassam house. The hope is that uh, we can put that bobsled on display in front of the soldiers and sailors building. This is a, an artist rendering of how we would like it to look more or less. We have to maybe work on the steps and re reconfigure those, but it would make the, the building a little bit more handicapped accessible and also um, allow us to show this important piece of Huntington history. And here it is now in its current location on the side of the Kazam barn, uh, waiting for uh, it to be moved up to soldiers and sailors. So getting back to the race. As I mentioned, the race starts on uh, the top of Lawrence Hill Road, otherwise known as uh, Colt Spring Hill, uh, Carley Avenue. Here's a view from 1843. And you can see you're up the top of the hill, you're looking all the way down to Old First Church. So it really is a great place, uh, great sledding hill, uh, which I wouldn't recommend anyone try it today. Here's the residential stretch of Main Street from Woodbury Road to Clinton Avenue, as it looked at the time of the Winter Carnival. Uh, there were still houses on Main Street. Then you get to the Empire Block, which is the block between Wall Street and New York Avenue. Here's the Methodist Church that the Huntington was photographed in front of. Then east of New York Avenue, you pass this uh, line of stores. These buildings all still exist. This one is no longer there, but the rest of them are still there. 
and then finally you'd come up to the Soldiers and Sailors building if you were lucky enough to fetch that far. Uh, and this, built, this picture is a great picture because you have the library and town hall and the train school all in one view. If you were uh, lucky or I don't know if, how much skill was involved, you might be able to get up this hill past the library up to the cemetery and then go back down the hill again to Spring Street. So those are the people who could really fetch far. So this is the last part. If you get, here's the cemetery up here. If you get up that hill, you go back down to Spring Street and approaching uh, Old First Church. Uh, nobody could have gotten back to Old First Church. Now the Winter Carnival was really the production of Harry Willits, who was an interesting character. This is a picture of him as a, as a young man, or actually as probably a, a teenager. And he looks like a bit of a character even in this picture. Uh, and uh, he was, and that's what they needed. He was Huntington's P.T. Barnum. He was from Camden, New Jersey. He had uh, three brothers. Two of the brothers came to Huntington in 1899 to run the electricity for the August Heckscher estate in Huntington Bay. Heckscher had purchased uh, the Mulligan estate and renovated it. And part of the renovation was, was adding electricity. So uh, the Willett brothers, Frank and Edward, were in Huntington. You can see another advertisement here or another notice from 1900 where they came up to wire the house of Sidney Smith, which is also in Huntington Bay. And in 1903, they did the uh, William Wilton Wood uh, house. Eventually they formed the Suffolk Electric Company, which does still exist. Uh, they uh, did all sorts of electrical work and were involved in the Huntington Light Power Company because you can't run electricity, uh, run wires through people's houses for lighting if there's not a power company to provide the electricity itself. So it, it made a lot of sense for them to do that. My favorite thing about what they did was that they did the electricity, phonographs, records, you know, that needs electricity, automobiles, that maybe makes sense. But they also sharpened skates, which seems a little out of, uh, out of their scope of work, but uh, they were full service. They eventually built the Willits building, which you may recognize. This is on New York Avenue. This is now Hanu Restaurant. Uh, it was built in 1909. Another brother, uh, Albert, started the Huntington Laundry. And here you can see it on the uh, 1909 map. It is on New York Avenue, just north of Gerard Street. Uh, First Street, uh, you see there on the right of the map, uh, is now Gerard Street. And then it was in the 1960s, continued across uh, to the west. And here we see a notice in 1903 that Harry Willits from Camden, New Jersey, came up to visit his brothers. Uh, and he would do some work for uh, his, the laundry. He would deliver uh, some of the clean laundry for people. And eventually he ended up sticking around town. Here he is. Uh, you can see he was a tall, gangly kid in that earlier picture. And here he is at the bar in the Suffolk Hotel, standing in the back uh, as the tallest man. He's always the tallest man in photographs. Here he is at the beach. Again, the tallest man on the beach. This is at Bowton Point in Lloyd Harbor. And you can see the old Lloyd Harbor uh, light here in the background. So as I said, he was the king of the carnival, carnival from 1907 to 1920. Here he is standing up at the, uh, the starting line. There's an interesting story. If you are very familiar with the story of Walt Whitman, you know that he started life in Huntington and ended life in Camden, New Jersey. Well, the Willits were from Camden, New Jersey. Uh, and as a young man, Harry Willits befriended uh, Walt Whitman, who was a, an older man uh, in a wheelchair who uh, used to like to uh, watch the kids in the playground uh, during recess. Um, Harry and his friends were a little older. They were teenagers and they used to pick on Walt Whitman and throw rocks at him and fruit at him. And uh, despite that, horrible treatment, Harry eventually became friendly with Walt and would wheel him over to uh, the schoolyard so he could watch the kids during recess. Walt had a traveling knife and fork. Here Harry is just demonstrating the knife and fork. The knife is in uh, the, the apple, I think it is, and on the fork he has a little piece. Walt used to use that. Uh, he got so frustrated with it because this little hook on the end of the knife would tear his pants pocket that he said uh, to Harry, here, you want these? And so Harry took them, held on to them for the rest of his life uh, for another 50 years or so, eventually gave them to his brother, 
and they ended up uh, being donated to the Huntington Historical Society. Here's a picture of the, the knife and fork with a note that Harry left for the uh, Historical Society and said, uh, he had a picture and he said, if you don't want this picture, return it to my brother. But the Historical Society did want the picture, so that's still in the collection. So how did they know when to schedule the winter carnival? How did they know there would be snow? It's, uh, they, they relied on the almanac, which was printed months in advance, so how accurate that could be. But there was somebody, and here he writes a letter to Harry Willits, signed a friend in 1908, and he promises snow on January 20th at 7.11 in the morning. And on February 12th at 6.45 in the morning. These are very specific. This is better than Doppler, whatever number we're up to, Doppler 10,000. Um, and we don't know who the friend was, but I suspect it may have been Professor Robert Hun, the sage of, Wal of Turkey Lane. He lived in Cold Spring Harbor. He was a bit of a character himself. He uh, was a wolf hunter at one point in his career. He sold fire extinguishers. Uh, he sold lightning rods that were guaranteed to work and had the uh, endorsement of Thomas Edison. And people would consult him before scheduling a picnic or any sort of outing. And there were some newspaper notices. They said, we have to see what Uncle Bob Hun says about the winter carnival and whether we'll have snow. So I suspect uh, that he helped them pick the dates. And oftentimes the date was not picked too far in advance. Here's something from February 11th where the Long Islander is talking about there may not be enough snow and ice for us to run the uh, winter carnival. And they asked Willits how long he would wait. And he said he would, he would uh, wait or hope, his hope for a winter carnival would not die until the June bugs hum. So he was willing to wait a long time. But in 1910, he didn't have to wait more than three days because by February 14th, they had the winter carnival. And how they managed to get the word out without sending emails or text messages back 120 years ago is pretty remarkable. But somehow they got the word to not only the Huntington Sledders, but the Sledders from uh, Oyster Bay and, and other towns uh, to show up. And there were probably, uh, the, the number of sleds varied from year to year. There were sometimes 14, sometimes one year, they said as many as 39 registered. Whether they all showed up, we don't know. Uh, but people uh, you know, did like to come. And I think now I'm gonna turn it over to Toby, who's gonna go to lead us through the course itself and some of the uh, sledders and the race. Hi, good uh, afternoon. Uh, I, uh, I'm going to uh, take you down the, down the hill, so to speak, with uh, the number of different sleds. But uh, I noticed that when he was going, he made those predictions in the last slide uh, that the, uh, the, the uh, 1908 wasn't held until 1910. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, the 1908 uh, race was held February 10th. So it, he was a little bit wrong there, though uh, he had snow coming in the morning of February 12th. It must have arrived a little bit earlier on, on that year. But that was, a, that was a really a big question. I'm just, uh, you know, when, when snow is going to come, are you going to have enough snow or, or whatever? And over the 14 year period, uh, there were actually nine winter carnivals held. Uh, three appear to have been canceled because of lack of snow for the bobsleds. They were in 1912 and 1913. Uh, 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 they had no races. Uh, they were scheduled. They were talked about, but they, they never came off. And then in 1917, they also uh, scheduled the race, but it was never held. And then the other two uh, that were not held were 19... Uh, uh, 1917 wasn't held, and the other two were 1918 and 1919. And when I think back to those periods, there was absolutely no mention of them. They didn't schedule them. Uh, in 1918, uh, uh, of course, in 19 was the World War One, and then the flu epidemic. The same thing that, that we're suffering through this. You couldn't get large crowds to come in the town during that period of time. And they did held, hold uh, a race in 1920, and that's the final race, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but uh, I think, the, and here's, again, we're gonna go through the course, but I think before that, I, I, I wanna read you from the 1914 recap of the race, exactly what they had to anticipate and go through uh, to get the course set up. And this is from the 1914 Long Islander. It says, a heavy snowstorm, uh, 
the heavy fall of snow on Friday last, followed by more on Saturday and a freeze on Sunday, made a bottom which seemed sufficiently good for immediate use. So the Carnival King Harry C. Willits and the local newspaper boys got busy and spread the glad tidings as best they could. So this was, uh, the decision was made on uh, Friday or going into Saturday and Sunday even. And on Monday night, about 30 of the local enthusiasts assisted by a number of Huntington firemen took off their coats and went to work the entire length of Main Street up to the library building, including the famous Cold Spring Hill were leveled down, smoothed over in the center, and then thousands of gallons of water from the mains of the local water company were sprayed over the entire course. Where the hoses didn't reach, buckets of water had to be carried up the hill. The course, uh, um, the course at Father York's Corner, which we're going to talk about uh, as being significant uh, to all those accidents we were talking about, in front of St. Uh, Patrick's Church, needed to be banked with snow to allow the big bobs to make the slight turn. Uh, when you saw those little beddies and the amount of turning radius they had, they, they didn't have... Uh, they didn't have a great margin of error in them, uh, and, they, and they couldn't turn uh, very sharply. And they, if you see from this course, uh, we start up at Carly, and you're going to see a water tower in a number of the photographs. And then we're going to identify the Grant Hamilton's house, which uh, was where the uh, Columbus statue is today. And then Doctor, and then there's another Doctor Sword's house, which comes into play particularly in 1920 when they had the accident. Uh, there's another house that I haven't labeled there, but it's uh, across the street from St. Pat's Church, about where the, uh, well, the drugstore is today in the Wild by Nature shopping center. There was a big house that we'll see. And then we come to Father York's Corner. And of course it's Father York's Corner because there was a, a good sized house that the, uh, menace, the, pres the priest, of uh, St. Pat's lived in, and his name was uh, Father York, and then hence Father York's Corner. As you crossed over Woodbury, we got down, uh, there was an accident at one point in front of the uh, uh, St. John's Episcopal Church there at Prospect, uh, and then there was the Methodist Church, which is gonna show up prominently in a lot of the photographs. Huntington House we've seen uh, earlier, that's where the finish line was for the time. Uh, and then the second Presbyterian church, which today called Central Presbyterian, it doesn't look the same because uh, uh, it's the second church of the second Presbyterian church. And today we have the third church was built there. And then finally, Soldiers and Sailors, when it turned to go uphill again, uh, and that's generally where uh, most of the sleds, if they could reach that far, uh, was where the uh, race ended. Um, okay, let's go to the uh, next slide. Um, and uh, the sleds came from all over Long Island. I mean, the, the main uh, hotbeds of bobsled racing seemed to be Locust Valley and Oyster Bay, and they held some races uh, themselves there, and the Huntington sleds would go to those communities, but the big race was clearly held here in Huntington. In some years, they came from places that were identified as Lindenhurst. I don't know how many hills they have down in Lindenhurst, but uh, uh, they were making sleds. They were never very successful coming, but there was talk of sleds coming and, and at times uh, they came from as far as way, away as Ossining, New York. Uh, uh, they came from Port Jefferson. Uh, they came from uh, other Long Island communities uh, and, and Connecticut. They, Stanford sent a sled at times. Again, they were never very successful on the Huntington courses. Uh, they seemed to have to be uh, uh, made in Huntington to be successful in the, in the winter carnival here. Now, how did you get uh, the sleds up the hill? Uh, they, they came, go back uh, to the slide. I think I meant to say something else there, if you would, Robert. Yeah, here, this is the sled from Matenecock. Uh, and uh, they came in a wagon. Uh, it was a, a girl sled. There were a number of those. And of course, they had to pull the big bob sled that would come from Locust Valley. So uh, this is how they got there. And then they had to get up the hill. And that's the next slide, or the next couple of slides, maybe. But uh, 
here you see the men helping uh, the Greyhound uh, girls, that's the Huntington girls sled, uh, up the hill. Uh, I, I, today I would call it probably the woman's sled, but uh, you see it labeled in the, in the pictures, the girl's sled, and it's called that in, the, uh, in all of the uh, articles that were written. You can see the man with the uh, camera in that last uh, photograph for a minute, if you go back. Now, if, uh, this, if this was Feather, he obviously didn't take this photograph. We're gonna see a number of uh, photographs by uh, Feather, but Lockwood also was known to take some photographs. Okay. Uh, this was one of the girl sleds up at the top of the uh, race course at Carley Avenue. There's one of the houses that uh, stands up there. It was the Matinecock. And again, the two girl sleds, the, there were more than that, but the two main ones were the Greyhound and the Matinecock. And they were also very fashionable. Uh, they, uh, uh, you know, they competed as far as how they were going to look and, and they appeared and they would get prizes for being the best looking crew. And uh, generally either the Matinecock or the, uh, uh, the Greyhound, which we'll see next, got one of those prizes. Once in a while, the men uh, got uh, matching sweaters and uh, uh, caps, and, and they were awarded uh, those prizes as well, or there were ties. The girls, uh, there was some controversy about them. Uh, the sleds had to be started uh, by, by pushing them. If you can think of the uh, bobsled races in the Olympics, how uh, they would, uh, or the luge, I guess they call it there, but they get the running start and then hop the board. Well, that's kind of how these got started up at the top of the hill as well, uh, from back behind the starting line. But the ladies in their skirts and so forth uh, didn't feel comfortable with that. So they would start on the, be on the sleds and uh, then they'd be pushed by the men. Uh, well, some of the sleds, when they came in a competition with the men, as far as timing goes and, and uh, fetch goes, uh, some of the men complained that that gave the, uh, the woman sled the advantage. And uh, so there was a little bit of a controversy on that. And of course, the other controversy was, it seemed that those were the uh, pictures uh, that made the papers. Uh, there were papers in the New York City papers. They were papers and I've uh, seen pictures of the Greyhound sled is from the West Coast talking about the uh, Huntington uh, bobsled races. Uh, and it was always the girls that seemed to get into the print. Um, okay. Now here's King Harry uh, uh, starting them out or checking them in at the top. Uh, they're a little below the starting line so I don't think uh, they've started yet, but uh, it's a little unclear, but you see this is a feather photograph and he writes on it on the, a lot of these uh, photographs come from postcards and there was a process where you could take a, a photograph and send it off to Kodak in upstate New York and they'd send you back a photograph. And if you etched in what you wanted to, uh, in this case, feather did it uh, there, you would, uh, get back a series of postcards. They were called photograph postcards and they're very rare, but one of the most popular of them were of these bobsled races. And we literally have stacks and stacks of uh, postcards of the bobsled races. Uh, you also see uh, a woman there uh, standing next to the uh, gentleman there on the right and it has a GH uh, on her sweater. Uh, that was the, at the time was the current uh, a greyhound uh, sweater and, and uh, the uh, costume that the ladies wore on that. Now the next one uh, it shows the Henrietta uh, which uh, in 1907 uh, was the winner. The only prize given at that first carnival was for the greatest fetch or the longest uh, fetch. Um, you can see it at the top of the hill and there's the water tower I was talking about and the first of the houses. Later on, you'll see some pictures uh, of a second house that's built in, uh, in front of that at, at some up at the top on Carley Avenue. And those houses still stand today, I believe. Uh, certainly the water tower still stands, but the tank on the top is off. And actually it's, it's uh, on the property of, of, of a modern house off of the first right hand uh, past Carly uh, off of Lawrence Hill Road. 
Uh, where did the, who made up these? What were the clubs? The firemen had, had sleighs. They came from the different towns. Here, the Cadillac uh, was the entry from the Samus and Downer entry. Uh, and you see there, appropriately named their bobsled, the Cadillac. Um, and here you see that second house, and also it's a, a feather painting. You see that second house there in front of the, uh, of the water tower at the top of the hill there. And here it's clearly, they're posing for a picture. They're not in the race. Okay, here we are at the start, and here's where we're going to begin to make our way down to the library building, or the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Building, as we know it today. Uh, here's another feather photograph uh, here, and this is the bobsled, the Mary. And now we saw the remaining runners on the Mary uh, uh, in that or in the collection of the Huntington Historical Society. And that's really when I first became interested in these bobsled races, when I discovered up in the loft of the Kassam, uh, the Kassam property barn, uh, these things that, and this one had the name Mary on it. So I began to do some investigation on it. Of course, we were missing the big board that went across the top of it. We only had the two Bettys. So I want to thank uh, again, Tom Ernst and Larry Leak, uh, who built the replica, a 16 foot uh, top board that we used uh, to demonstrate what the entire bobsled would look like. Of course, this was before we owned some of the complete sleds that Robert pointed out that are in the collection today. Uh, we still have that uh, fabricated board up at the top, uh, but we no longer pull it out since we have uh, the complete sleds that uh, we, we Robert showed earlier. Uh, this shows uh, the Mary uh, is is piloted by uh, Michael Connell, and that, that name probably rings a bell to most of us that live here. The Connell Funeral Home up in Huntington Station was founded by Michael. Uh, he's Michael is the pilot of this sled. Uh, you see him in front. You see him if you go back one. You'll see the same guy. This is the 1910 race, so he's a he's a little bit younger. He's a little bit older in 1915. Uh, he was born in 1890. Uh, was the son of uh, John Connell, who was a, a, a house builder, a carpenter, uh, and uh, they lived over on Maple Hill Road. Uh, and they had a sister, Mary. So I suspect this was a family uh, run affair. Uh, they named the bobsled after the sister. Uh, Michael was the pilot uh, and it was probably built by Father John, uh, their, their house building father. Uh, this, uh, uh, you know, I, I've just recently discovered uh, the, this. Uh, Michael uh, graduated from high school probably in 1908 somewhere around then anyway and he didn't go off to world war one until uh, 17 and 18 is when he was uh, overseas he was a bugler uh he was a member of saint pat's church uh and very active in the community when he came home he married a nurse and uh, they decided uh well before he he went to war he worked for the uh uh, Huntington Power and Light Company, which was run by the Willits family. And I can't help but to think that there's some connection in his interest in bobsleds uh, maybe came through a friendship with Harry. Um, of course, after the war, uh, he comes home and he uh, starts the funeral business. Uh, he marries his wife, who was a nurse at Huntington Hospital. All right, here we're starting the, the, uh, across the finish line in 19... Uh, uh, the 1909 race uh, was scheduled for uh, January 19th, but it wasn't held for two weeks. In this case, it wasn't the weather that held it up, but it was the uh, uh, the fact that the, they had trouble running the wire to, for the starting device. And uh, actually, I think that was in 1909. Uh, but here is the starting device is this little uh, bump in the road where that arrow shows that uh, ran down to the finish, so it started the clock as the, as the sleds crossed there. You'll see King Harry there with the megaphone on the left, uh, and they're right at the top uh, of Cold Spring Hill. Here you, we have the old woman's uh, sled, the old girl's sled, uh, the Greyhound, uh, 
the pilot of that was Tom Haggerty, who owns owned the sled. Uh, the sled was also loaned to uh, later on in the uh, uh, race series was loaned to the Adelphi uh, Boys School from Brooklyn, and they were actually successful in, in winning uh, one of the prizes one year. Uh, but Tom made sure he piloted even with he had a sled and when he had a crew of girls. Here we're coming down the top of the hill, uh, and if you ever drive down this way, you can see, you appreciate the fall. On the left there, you see the just the uh, house uh, just the porch of a house, and uh, down below you see a, another bigger house. The porch is right where the Columbus statue is today, uh, and the bigger house is about where the uh, 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 drugstore, the pharmacy, is across from St. Pat's Church. So in between there is when 25A is joining Lawrence Hill Road. So the next slide, we get a little closer to that house uh, down across from St. Pat's. Uh, and you can see here, this is a, a race that uh, from 08 uh, that was taken, which was the second one. And the 1907 race uh, only awarded the uh, one prize for fetch because that's really all they could determine. They hadn't figured out how to, how to have a time course yet. 1908, they decided to have a time course, but there was great controversy. I don't know how they, they were shouting when the when they crossed the starting line and uh, and then time to the finish. I don't know how they did that. They didn't have any electronic device. 1909 is when they uh, got the uh, electronic device in, and as I said, there, there was uh, it was scheduled for January 19th in 1909, but it didn't occur to February 2nd because of the delay installing the timing mechanism. But it turned out to be of great advantage because there was a huge blizzard on January 30th that created severe racing conditions. Uh, and a crowd of about 4,000 showed up uh, and it was one of the more successful and more uh, attended of the races. Uh, the, uh, uh, there was a, a, a a dog uh, or a spectator, the spectator survived. I guess the spectator in this race kind of wandered on to the course. Everyone wonders with, with anything, anybody was killed, but uh, a spectator wandered onto the course here and was hit by one of the racing sleds, throwing him a distance, but he survived. Uh, and there was never any uh, human death in there, but we'll talk about uh, later on. There were a couple of accidents that uh, led to the demise of, of a pet. So as we come down closer down the hill, I think you can see coming in on the left there is 25A as we get closer to that uh, house that's across from St. Pat's Church where that pharmacy is today. And you can see how steep the hill is getting. And uh, there are, uh, you know, we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, uh, yeah, here we're, here we're coming down in front of that house or toward that house. The house we see up in the back there is where the uh, Columbus statue is today. You can see a car there coming in where 25A is joining uh, in the Lawrence Hill Road. And so now we're on Main Street. And of course, this is another feather photograph that was taken in 08. The course was marked by these nail kegs along the way. And that was supposed to keep the spectators at bay here. Now in 08 was the second race, and so you don't see a big crowd. The big crowds don't show up until 09, and we'll see some pictures later on where the crowds are a lot more dense than they appear to be here. So here we passed that house there where the pharmacy is, uh, and now we're coming into what is Father York's uh, corner and you can see the speed. This photograph is the one photograph that really shows you uh, the, how fast the, the bobsleds appear to be going anyway. He's just about to uh, cross Woodbury Road and, and West Neck Road, that intersection there. And as we remember from the course, it takes a, a slight turn, seemingly a slight turn, but it's a little bit harder for some of these big sleds to make that turn. And that's where a lot of the accidents cur occurred. But Father York, of course, lives on the uh, south side of Main Street, across from that barn. That barn is in front of uh, the uh, John Wood House, which is a little bit further back on uh, 
West Neck Road. Here is almost in the same location is uh, the uh, well-dressed uh, uh, J.S. Hirschfeld's 999 sled. Uh, Joel Hirschfeld, uh, who was an early benefactor of the Huntington Historical Society, uh, one of our endowment funds is the Hirschfeld Fund, named after Joel. And in the 1908 race, uh, the 999 sled was crossing New York Avenue and a dog wandered into the path and unfortunately it didn't survive the collision. There were lots of collisions and spills, but only one fatality and luckily it was uh, a pet, not a, not a human. Now this, we're looking at the old wood home. It's, it's identified here in 1917. Uh, and it stood a little bit off of Main Street down, we're looking north on West Neck Road here. Uh, and you can see a car uh, in 1917. And uh, I think one of the people standing there appears to be uh, possibly a World War I era soldier. Uh, it looks like he's got a uniform on. Uh, we don't know who it is or, or for sure, but uh, they're there witnessing the race. Now we've crossed over uh, Woodbury Road and we're headed into a residential uh, part of Main Street there from West Neck Road to Clinton. Uh, of course, at the corner of Clinton, there was uh, the first uh, commercial building, which was the Long Islander officer, now Rose's Pizza, I think. Uh, but uh, west of Rose's Pizza, all along that lane, there were these houses. Uh, the house at the corner was a Rogers house. Uh, and the house in the middle was the Dr. William Woods house. Uh, and then the Lockwood uh, 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 Marble uh, Company owned the next couple of houses. And then you finally got to the uh, Long Islander office. But it's this postcard that in, uh, inspired Finnegan's uh, postcard in 1954, uh, where someone obviously saw that postcard and decided to sketch it. And Finnegan's mailed it out. As, as their Christmas card. Now, as Robert mentioned, <clears throat> Finnegan's played, a, am sure, a big part in the race uh, being uh, the barkeeper at, uh, uh, um, at uh, uh, the corner of, of Wall Street at the Huntington House uh, where the finish line was. And we'll see large crowds hanging around that. Of course, by the time that the 1920 race uh, happened, uh, there, the taverns were open, were closed, and that was uh, a difference that was noted uh, in the 1920 carnival. There were, the bars were all closed by that time. So the next picture is, uh, shows again that same section. Uh, you see the two houses, the one on the corner of uh, the Rogers house and the Young house, uh, I believe is the second house in. Um, and you can see the crowds are a little bit larger as we get on in toward the timed end course. Here, uh, same section, uh, we're passing that, uh, uh, the Young House, I think, and we're just coming in front of the uh, uh, Dr. Wooden's house, which was built in 1860, right across from Prospect. And it's on this property uh, that the barn that Will, Walt Whitman first started, the Long Islander was. Uh, it was moved to the back of the property uh, in, in 1860 when the wooden house was put, it was built. Uh, but so it's, you don't see it in the picture, but it's, it's back there during this time. And finally, uh, we're still passing the wooden house uh, in, in that same section. Uh, and you can see, uh, this looks like uh, one of the larger of the bobsleds. You, you can see in this picture, I think a pretty good idea how the pilot is the only one that controls anything. The others are only providing weight. Uh, and they say fully loaded that there were, uh, these sleds were over 2000 pounds uh, coming down that hill. Uh, we're gonna see a picture that said the, uh, the course record was 38 seconds. Uh, and we'll try to explain what that meant. Uh, and when we get to that slide. Here, uh, you sit, you're crossing, uh, before you get to the Huntington House, the flag really, uh, the American flag in the middle is really the beginning of the property of the Huntington House, which is set back off the street. Uh, the first building on the left still stands today. Uh, it was the building uh, that was for a 
time in the 20s anyway was the Aboffs paint building. Uh, they actually started in a building on the south side of Main Street, but uh, I think they had that building built. Uh, and so I have a tendency to identify it as the Aboff building. The Romano uh, uh, grocery store ended up there for a period of time. And then they built the larger building that stands today uh, called the Romano building when they expanded their business later on in the uh, in the decade. Uh, but here we're before 1909, I think. Um, and you see that this is one of, this is probably 1909 race because they anticipated in the 1909 race that there would be, that they estimated the crowd between three and 4,000. So uh, it was one of the races that uh, had the greatest uh, attendance to. But this is one of the smallest ones. Here's a, uh, this uh, this is really out of sequence. Uh, this is after the race is over. They're headed the wrong way, uh, east of New York Avenue, uh, against the up by almost across from the Second Presbyterian Church there. Uh, and this is the old Hickory, which was one of the very early sleds. Uh, I read in one of the accounts where they busted their original top board and had to uh, get a new one put on the two uh, Bettys that they still maintained. The old Hickory, uh, I don't know where that name comes from, but there was also a baseball team with the same name. And it was um, a run, had, must had something to do with uh, the Thompson uh, Plumbing Company, I think. Here is a bigger crowd, whether it's 1909, uh, they had big crowds in 1911 and 1915 as well, uh, but it's in front of the Huntington House. Uh, and what you're looking at really uh, is uh, the corner of Wall Street uh, and, and Main Street uh, uh, on the north side. The big building there on the east corner has been taken down. Uh, that was a, a sizable brick building that became the uh, bank, the second, or the, bank, the National Bank of Huntington for a good period of time. Uh, and, but it's since been taken down. Here you see that same crowd and, and you see the sign that says the Huntington House and imported Pilsner on draft uh, is uh, what they were serving in uh, 1909. That was before Finnegan's got there because the owner of the bar there was the Meyer Company. Uh, the building across the street there uh, on the corner of New Street is of course a famous building in Huntington's history. Uh, that became the hamburger choo-choo in the 50s uh, before it burned down. And I'm sure most of you know that. Uh, here we show the, one of the big sleds uh, crossing over uh, Wall Street uh, and New Street. Uh, they've just passed it. You'll see that uh, Huntington House Hotel there on the right there. Um, and uh, they're headed to New York Avenue. And again, they're in that same stretch of land. You're just looking at the other side of the street. You see the big bank building there, uh, as well as the dry goods company uh, building. Uh, and you can see it's a good picture of the flag in front of the Huntington House and uh, the Methodist Church, which we really haven't pointed out before. Uh, that stood at the corner of Clinton. Uh, uh, and uh, it's the second church at that location that was built and it was, this one was uh, 1900 and it uh, included a, a, a clock in the, in the steeple, uh, which you see up there. It was one of the number of town clocks they had here. All right, here you're looking at the south side of New York Avenue uh, and you're looking at the Suffolk Hotel building that was pointed out earlier. Uh, and again, you see the crowds lining the streets uh, and uh, as, as the sleds would be, a approaching New York Avenue and the trolley tracks, which of course the trolley, that was uh, uh, where everybody hoped to get past the trolley tracks. And here you're looking in the other direction at a familiar building up there, the library building. And you haven't uh, quite crossed New York Avenue yet. Uh, you see the, the building on the left, uh, all those buildings, except for the last one on the, on the north side, still stand. Uh, the building, the first building on the left was actually uh, built uh, 
when was that built? Uh, it was it was in the 1869. 1869 uh, as a house, really. Uh, that was the uh, Bayless house, uh, the Hiram uh, V. Bailey. Ba no, not Hiram. Bayless. Who was it? Not Hiram. I think it's Hiram Bayless. Was it Hiram? Was that his yes. house? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. He later became, uh, or, or his son became, uh, took over the editorship of the of the Long Islander and. 20th century. But um, so here you have a sled that's about to cross. You can see it's 1910, I think, is uh, the date on the uh, postcard. And you can see the number of horse and buggies that are still around in town. Uh, it's interesting. The, uh, one of the uh, races that uh, in 1914, uh, it, it talks about, we're going to see some other uh, pictures in a minute that have a lot more cars in them. But uh, the, the trophies, they were, there were monetary prizes for the winner of best time and for longest fetch, but there were also trophies given. And the trophies for best time were the Squadron C trophy uh, that was given by uh, uh, the Brooklyn uh, Squadron C that had a summer property out uh, on the uh, south side of Lawrence Hill Road. Uh, there and uh, it's a, a property that went all the way over to where uh, Woodbury Road really uh, was a large piece of property that they used to come out in the summer and in practice I guess or just summer and then the Brooklyn Eagle the paper of uh, the city paper kind of also gave a trophy for the race but the longest fetch trophy or cup was uh, offered by uh, Henry Stimson who is uh, one of the more famous people that have lived in Huntington. Uh, he had an estate uh, called... Uh, uh, High Hold. High Hold, right. Out by High Hold Road today uh, in the West Hills. Uh, and uh, he was a real sports enthusiast and held uh, what he called uh, Thanksgiving Day games. Uh, and uh, so he was a very much enthusiastic about the... Uh, uh, the bobsled in the Winter Carnival, uh, and he offered his, his name to a cup that was awarded to the longest fetch. Uh, he shows up in the 1914 race uh, in a sleigh, in a horse-drawn sleigh from his estate high hold out in the West Hills, uh, and he expresses the interest of riding the, the tarantula down the hill. Uh, he was, at that time, he, he was secretary of war maybe. Uh, he was an early Secretary of War and uh, he ended up his career as a Secretary of War for Truman uh, at the end of World War II uh, and uh, but he participated in World War I as well. Uh, we have a portrait, his portrait and his wife's portrait are hanging in the uh, scholars room at uh, our trade school building. Uh, we're fortunate to have that in the collection. But also at the 1914 uh, race, William K. Vanderbilt shows up, but he shows up in his automobile, uh, which is uh, typical, I think. Uh, and he was enthusiastic about the race. Of course, he was familiar with races, uh, running the Vanderbilt Cup race for many years on Long Island. All right, we're finally crossing uh, New York Avenue here, uh, headed uh, looking west. Uh, the sleds, of course, heading east and headed to the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Building or is identified at the day of the library building. It was a library, as most of you know, until 1958 uh, when it moved down to the, uh, the telephone building uh, at the corner of Prospect and Main Street, which is where it is today. It's been expanded from the telephone building. Here you have the woman's sled uh, in 1915 uh, crossing over. You're looking at south side of Main Street now. The Colonial Market uh, was was run by uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, Teach brothers, actually. And the big brick building, of course, was the Brush Block building uh, that replaced the original Brush Block building, which burned down. And they're just about passing uh, in front of where uh, the Second Presbyterian Church, or today the Central Presbyterian Church, is located. And it's before the bank building, uh, which was built later that year and opened in 1916. And here you're looking west, uh, you see the uh, 
column, uh, the Nathan Hale column there on the left. Uh, you can just about see the second, uh, second Presbyterian Church steeple there that may, it was a brick building uh, and it's there just past that uh, column on the left. And you can see the water trough in front of the uh, uh, column. Uh, it's a Sanford, Stanford White, uh, Sanford White, Sanford, Sanford, Sanford White uh, designed column. Uh, and uh, across the street uh, was the, the estate of John Oakley House. And this has trying out before, so it's one of the trials. What would happen, the races a lot of the time didn't happen until late in the afternoon. They would arrive during the early morning or in the, during the morning, and then they would be allowed three trials. And that comes into play when we talk about the 1920 race. Uh, but uh, so that said, uh, trying out at first, I suspect was one of the trials. This clearly uh, is during the race and you can see the chute there that's made by the crowds as the bobsleds make the turn. They are probably slowed down quite a bit so they can make that turn fairly successfully. Uh, and this is taken probably from the Soldiers and Sailors uh, Memorial Building or the Library Building. And here you see a, a sled uh, coming into that chute in 1908. Again, the crowd was not as big in 1908. That was only the second race. The crowd swelled in after 1909 or, or after the 1908 race when it really came uh, into prominence. Um, and finally, you, you see, you're watching, not finally, but the Yankee winning for the longest fetch. Uh, after also posting the fastest time. The Yankee from Oyster Bay won both uh, prizes in 1908 during that second race. The crowd is pretty big at the finish. Uh, you can see them lined up there in the cemetery and uh, up on the uh, library building uh, there. And uh, it looks like they've got some speed still left in them. And here again, you'll see, uh, you'll see this is a later race, I think. Uh, there's different snow conditions on it. Uh, and maybe the, the 14 race, the 14 car carnival was the most contested of the races. It was held in, held in uh, February 16th, uh, again with excellent conditions and a huge crowd. Uh, the Locust Valley sled uh, in 1911 uh, and the Huntington sled, the Tarantula fought it out in both the fastest time and longest stretch. Uh, the time was 38 seconds. Uh, I think we're going to see that uh, that time posted on another one. Here the sleds are returning. Uh, it says winner in Huntington. Uh, it's re coming down uh, opposite the race course. It looks like it could be in 1908 again where the crowds weren't so big. Now this is the bobsled from Locust Valley that, that ended up taking most of the prizes. Their competition was the tarantula, that was the Huntington sled, but uh, it won the longest fetch in uh, 11, 14, 15, and 20, and the fastest time in 15 and in 20. Uh, but uh, in uh, 14, they tied for the fastest time as well, uh, but they lost in the runoff uh, when they had to have it. They both finished the course in 38 seconds. And so I'll, I'll, again, I'll wait until that slide comes up. I'm pretty sure it's coming up. Here again is uh, posed for a, a photograph. The sleds are headed in the opposite direction. You'll see the firehouse there off to the right uh, is now added 19, after 1911. That was built in 1911 to the other buildings uh, that were built earlier on that we have seen before. And the, the Yankee was from Oyster Bay, uh, was the winner of the 19-0 race, again, posed in front of the uh, 19, uh, hmm, this can't be 1908. Uh, that's they 19 won in 1908, but the picture wasn't taken they, in yes, 1908. Right. The, the picture has to be after 1908 because the town hall was built in 1910, but they continued racing. They won the race in 1908. And the Domino from Cold Spring Harbor was uh, uh, one of the uh, sleds that uh, you can see uh, how beautiful really it is if you get a chance to look at the front of that sled where it's slightly curved up to give the, the pilot a kind of a lift off the front there. And it's got uh, pin, uh, what do they call that? Uh, pin striping 
on it uh, so he could lean over that and control the, the, the turning apparatus uh, on that first Betty. Okay, here's the slide I've been waiting for. It says the tarantula who had the record of 38 seconds in one mile. Now that's not what happened. Uh, the records were 38 seconds in time. Uh, the, the, the other record was for the fetch because it was in 1914 under those great conditions that both the locust valley sled and the tarantula crested the hill, which is called the library hill uh, or old bearing ground hill, we would call it today. Or uh, it was even called the herd hill because the herd lived in the house that was in the parking lot, which we call the elks uh, um, parking lot. Uh, so, and, and so they all went over that hill, went down to Spring Street, and probably gaining speed as they went down Spring Street, even crossed over Spring Street and started up toward the Presbyterian Church. There's a rumor they got halfway up that hill. That may or may not be true, but the record of that is about a mile. When we've measured the time course, which is from the top of Carley down to uh, uh, Wall Street, basically, we figured that that was about a half a mile and if you uh, figure out, do the math on that, it meant that they averaged 47 miles per hour during the race, uh, which meant that during the steep part of the race, they were probably traveling about 60 miles per hour. And that's where the 60 miles per hour at that turn at Father York's corner uh, proved to be uh, a disaster for some of the sleds. Okay, oh. here is the tarantula. They did get the fastest time uh, uh, in one. In that race, the tarantula, they both tied with the Locust Valley for 38 seconds, but in the runoff, uh, the tarantula, the Locust Valley sled broke its one of its beddies uh, at that turn uh, on at West Neck Road at Father York's Corner. And so the fastest time went to the, or the, the, the trophy and the prize money went to the tarantula in 1914. Okay, here's the Dorothy, uh, which is uh, another one. As I said, the, the Mary was named for the sister uh, or the daughter of the builder, probably. The Dorothy, again, was probably named uh, for the wife. And it's on this sled that uh, 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 Michael Connell's brother, William, uh, was one of the uh, one of the men in the back. He didn't steer it. It was steered by the owner, Smith. Okay, here are some of the sleds. This is one, it was an interesting story about this. Uh, the Greenlawn uh, Fire Department had a sled, and it was called the Greenlawn Sled, and they got word that there was this great sled from Schenectady, New York, that they could uh, buy, and it would was breaking all records up there. So they bought this sled, and it was this kind of weird sled where the, the driver stood up or sat up and, and steered with the steering wheel. It turned out not to be very successful at all, uh, and they kind of bagged it. They didn't use it after that. I think the next slide uh, looks that in 1915 gets them back to the, the local design sled, uh, which was, uh, again, proved to be much more successful on the Huntington course. All right, now we're getting to the 1920 race uh, when we uh, have, we talk about the Greyhound. The, the, uh, they didn't have races in 12 and 13. They came back in 14 and had a spectacular race that we've talked about. They had good races in 15 and 16. In 17, they planned a race, <clears throat> but didn't, uh, it didn't, it never came off probably because of the weather. Uh, and in 18 and 19, we talked about there was no carnival, but they came back in 20. And now in 20, you got to figure that this idea of throwing thousands of gallons of water on Main Street during the wintertime was not really a convenient thing for most of the people that lived in Huntington. But they, this was the last hurrah. And a lot of people blame it on the fact that there was a serious accident uh, in the woman's sled. Uh, here, it's posed for a photograph in 1915. Uh, you see Haggerty is pointing in the back, standing in the back, and it looks like the driver is a woman. Well, that was never allowed. Tom Haggerty owned the sled, and he always piloted uh, 
the sled in the races. Uh, but here uh, was, so it was only for the picture uh, that there was a woman posed there. Here he is during the race. Uh, and uh, there were about as many as 20 girls uh, on the back of that sled uh, at certain times. And uh, what happened during the race uh, is that uh, they were told that uh, they had one more trial to make. Uh, and uh, so they were taking a trial run. And as they went down the hill, uh, the photographers wanted to take their picture in an action, uh, so to speak. And so he yelled to them to turn and all the girls turned to the same direction and that shifted the weight of the sled and it hit a rut uh, about at York's corner and he flipped over. Well, luckily it was uh, right across the street lived Dr. Sword and he came over immediately. Also, luckily the Huntington Hospital uh, uh, was put up, uh, even though it was a little bit far away, but it was up and running. It opened in 1916. So there was plenty of uh, good medical care for the uh, people that uh, had an accident. And uh, uh, so nobody got seriously hurt. I guess a woman may have lost uh, the sight out of one of her eyes on this. We have uh, some people listening that may know more about that race than, than I do right now. But uh, uh, we would be anxious to hear about it. So they're po posing for one more picture before the crash, and this is taken in 1920, uh, and uh, obviously before they had, and, and Feather is still taking the photographs. Actually, Mrs. Feather, one of the reasons uh, he's taking the photograph is because his wife is, is, a, is a member of that sled. I don't know which one she is, uh, but uh, Mrs. J.V. Feather uh, was listed as uh, on board the, the Greyhound. Uh, here's a picture taken in 1915 that is uh, used a lot because that was uh, one of Huntington's great suffragists. Uh, uh, Ida Bunce Samus is there with a sign. It was a posed picture again. It's headed the wrong direction. It's uh, east of New York Avenue uh, and you see the firehouse again. But uh, this was taken uh, you know, in, in an effort to, uh, to gain the uh, woman to gain the vote. Uh, and that was granted in New York State in 1917, I believe, or 18. Uh, 17. I, 17. And Ida Bunce Samus in 18 ran for the assembly in one. Uh, and uh, she served one term there. Uh, and then she was defeated. But she was a very active uh, uh, legislator uh, with a number of different bills to, credited to her. Another person on the sled was Ethel Harris. Uh, she had just announced her engagement to Harold Brush, uh, who I believe is the Brush who owned the, the now uh, or the original gas station at the corner of Park Avenue and uh, uh, Main Street uh, that has been in the news uh, even today that corner, uh, and she was injured. Uh, she also, uh, well, she ended up being a teacher at the Elwood School, way there on Cuba Hill Road, I believe, that still stands. But before that, uh, I believe she was a, a, an operator in the telephone building that I mentioned earlier at the corner of Prospect, across from the St. John's Episcopal Church, that now is the public library. And here they're coming back up the hill. This is Tuttle's sled called Tuts was the name of that one. Um, I, I see the chat, there was a question, was anybody sued after the 1920 accident? I don't, don't know of anybody being sued after that. But here's one of the sleds being pulled up the hill. And of course you see the, uh, they've got to stay off the track. Uh, there was a report in one of the years of an accident where a downcoming sled ran into a upcoming sled uh, and caused a, a problem, called the downcoming sled to flip over. Uh, and here you see more of that pulling uh, them up the sled. Uh, that's the house, I believe, that's at the, uh, across from the St. Pat's Church that we were mentioning when we were looking at the downhill pictures. And um, let's see, there's another one uh, coming up that shows this is the Grant Hamilton house. Now, the interesting thing about the Grant Hamilton house, he, he built the house uh, on Cove, uh, Cove Road that was, uh, that was bought by Clinton, uh, 
Gilbert Clinton, uh, or Clinton Gilbert, Clinton Gilbert, I believe, uh, that still stands today. It's a magnificent white house that overlooks the, the water, uh, the bay. Uh, a lot of people in the uh, Huntington Bay call it the Clute House, I think. Uh, but he sold that and he built this house, uh, which is where the uh, uh, Columbus statue is today. Uh, now, it burned down uh, somewhere between 1909 and 1917. And uh, when they were looking for property to, to put the hotel, the hotel, hospital. I mean, not the hotel, the hospital, uh, the hospital hadn't been built yet. Uh, one of the considered properties was this triangle uh, where the Columbus statue is today. Uh, and I can't imagine uh, the hotel of uh, the hospital expanding the way it is expanded in its current location. It's a little tight down there, but, and it's expanding all the way to 25A and all of the offices and uh, emergency care facilities that they use. I can't see that happening if this site was chosen for the hospital. Uh, it wasn't a, a building, uh, with a, a house replaced this house uh, and uh, then was taken down when the, uh, the building where the, in, behind the Columbus statue was put up. Okay, there were, as, as Robert mentioned earlier, there were also single sled uh, uh, races. Now these sometimes came late in the day. Uh, they sometimes only got one heat where the big bobs got three runs down during that were all timed and the fastest time was the one that was counted. Uh, but these were all, and we saw some of that in that exhibit that we had in the barn. Some of these sleds are in the collection. Uh, and uh, I think the next slide, I, I love it, is the uh, Pearl. Uh, and that he, that he was getting his running start and he was just about to, to land on the hill. And there's uh, the king of the carnival again, standing by at the top watching the race. And here they're coming down the hill. Uh, they look a little uh, forlorn, being lonely. Actually, it looks like there's a single sled next to a bobsled as they're coming down the hill here. Uh, I can't, don't really recognize where that is on the course though, but I thought it was a nice picture. <laughs> and here's another one uh, showing up near the top. You can see that thing. And here they are coming down uh, Main Street. Uh, they, they are single sleds because they, they're not bob sleds, which are two sleds, obviously, but there could be multiple people on them. Uh, and it looks like there's more than one uh, person aboard there. And I'm going to finish with, uh, which may be the, the first snowmobile. Uh, there was uh, a couple of, we have a couple of pictures uh, from the 1909 carnival of what is called Freak 2. And that's because Freak was the name of uh, uh, a bobsled out of Huntington. Uh, wasn't very successful. And therefore, I don't think we saw it uh, in the race or talked about it. But Freak 2 was a motorized uh, uh, bobsled. And it was made by three men in, in Huntington in Hale site. Uh, and, uh, I guess, and this is uh, a picture that we had seen uh, earlier. This is uh, the Romanos building. Uh, when we, when you looked at that, uh, the Lockwood, uh, the Lockwood uh, photography, uh, when we saw that early on uh, above in the second floor of the George Rogers uh, pharmacy, uh, it's, this is where we are. There's the Romanos first store. It's east of New York Avenue. Uh, uh, on the north side. Um, it's see, west of New York Avenue. It's between New York Avenue and Wall. I'm sorry, it's in the Empire Block. You're right. Uh, and uh, that was where the first uh, uh, Romanos were in the, the building on the far right is a bakery, uh, the Mason Bakery. And the three gentlemen that, that built the freak uh, were William Robbins, James Ott, and Charlie Diefendorfer. Uh, and you can see where it's a bobsled, therefore it belongs in the show here, uh, but it's driven uh, now by uh, some wheels, spoked wheels with chains on the, on the tires. And uh, where the snowmobile today is uh, functions or is driven differently, uh, it still has, and has skis rather than, than runners. Uh, this could have been uh, 
the early inspiration anyway for the Bob for the uh, snowmobile. And the last slide, I guess, is something uh, I just found this one fairly late and added it in. Uh, this is another homegrown contraption uh, that I believe uh, I don't necessarily recognize it being Huntington though. Do you, Robert? The background no, it, may not, it may not be Huntington, uh, I don't think but so. this looks like with that wheel driving something. Uh, it looks like it's it's more in line with what the snowmobile uh, became when it was driven by a belt that would. Uh, pick up and drive and get traction over the snow. Um, so anyway, so I think that's the last. And thank you for putting up with us uh, again. <laughs> and uh, thanks for joining us. And I hope you uh, learned some things. I think Robert and I learned some things in putting it together. I did because Toby put it together. <laughs> well, you did a great job in the first half. <laughs> Let me say that. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, questions. Robert and Toby. All right, we have questions. First is, what was the name of the girl who had the bad accident that put an end to the races? Well, uh, there were a number of, of girls injured. Uh, the bad, uh, some more severely. Some were taken to the hospital uh, that, it, that was new at the time, really. Uh, and some were attended to by Dr. Sword, who ran across the the course, uh, because he lived across the street. Actually, I think the woman uh, from is, is with us that can tell us that, right? Can you unmute uh, yourself and tell us uh, who the girl was who, who lost her eye in the, in the accident, the Greyhound? Was that your relative, Betty? You have to unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, my relative was Lola Archer. She was injured. Archer, right, right. But the last name of the person who, and actually I was looking at it before, was Romano. And oh, it really? was part of the Romano... Uh, Groceries. Groceries. Grocery yeah. yeah, right. And she, right. Was she was taken. She was very, you know, pretty, worst, the worst of them all. She was the worst of them all yeah. and ended up in the hospital. Yeah, um, I didn't know that, but that's a great piece of information. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, it's appropriate because we saw the Romano, the first Romano store on the Empire Block, and then later on they built the the bigger store uh, uh, between uh, uh, Clinton and uh, Wall Street and Clinton further yeah, west. If, yeah, if you go to historic newspapers, I did it just before I came on. Um, Long Islander of February sixth, twenty twenty of 1920, I'm sorry, has the article about this race. Yeah, I, I mean, that's where I get a lot of my information. Yeah. I just didn't I put in my father's up. name. I put in my father's name and that whole thing came up. Oh, so, good. Or good. Lola Archer's name or one of them. So yeah. that those, whole article those are, tells that's everything a, about it. Yeah, that's a great resource. And that's where all of our information comes from. Mm -hmm. They did make a motion picture of it. And I think the 1916 race, they talked about it. And it was shown at the Bijou uh, Theater, which was on Wall Street. There were a number of them, but they were on either corner of where uh, Gerard Street, I guess, comes across. Mm -hmm. they were, there was one on each one of those corners, uh, was the Bijou Theater. And it was shown uh, there. I wish we had a copy of it because uh, it was a local uh, motion picture company in town, but uh, we haven't been able to come across it. But the information in the Long Islander is where a tremendous amount, Brooklyn Eagle too. Yeah. And as I said, I've seen articles about this from a, a Portland, Oregon paper that somebody sent us uh, with a picture of the Greyhound uh, in it. and. Uh, uh, so forth and so on and talked about. So there was wild, uh, a widespread, uh, um, you know, popularity or, or uh, notoriety anyway, uh, for this race. Um, and it was known throughout the country. I, I think that I, I had here somewhere uh, something I was going to try to read and then I don't know whether I I don't seem to have it, but they they talked about how the, it was the carnival that opened the eyes for people uh, all over the world. They said, uh, 
and uh, how it how it made Huntington the most prominent town on Long Island, uh, which uh, uh, I think is is you know we we didn't lack uh, confidence uh, when we promoted ourselves here in Huntington during the years. Uh, and as Robert mentioned, we loved to party. I mean, it started back. It was a great celebration. In, 1892, uh, the 400th celebration for Columbus. That was the year the, the public library opened. Uh, we had a big celebration in the centennial. Uh, every 4th of July had celebrations. Of course, the biggest one being in 1903. So those are topics for future talks, I guess. Another question? Yes, we have, I believe there was a Tiffany window installed at the original train station. Is that true? Uh, the original, does it say train station? The original train station. Uh, I don't know Probably. that, Robert. The original train station from 1867, I doubt it. That, that was, yeah, Tiffany. didn't really have too many windows. And that, I don't, wouldn't even think the 1909 train station would have had windows either, uh, Tiffany windows. I've never heard that. Which is anyway. the current station, of course, the 1909 right. one. Yeah, I haven't heard that either. If you have any more information about that, the person who asked the question, if you don't mind just putting it in the chat box, and then we can look into it further. Uh, someone asks, is Suffolk Electric the same company Jack Idler owns now? I believe so. I mean, he's using the name. Uh, I think it's a continuous, and he claims it's continuous from... 1903. Yeah. Um, I think it says that on his truck, if anybody else knows. Uh, but I don't know whether he bought the business out. Uh, I know uh, Frank died uh, very young. He died in 1923. He was one of the brothers that ran it. Edward didn't die until uh, 1950. But Frank died in, in 23. Uh, and he had already retired, he talked about, the fact that he had been so successful. Now, he may have only retired, though, from the Huntington Power Company, now that I come to think of it. He may still have been running the Suffolk County Electric, or Suffolk, Suffolk Electric. Okay, someone asks, is the water tower still on Carly? It's, yes, the, it's not on uh, Carly. It's in, it's in the backyard of a house on Winoka. Is it Winoka? Yeah, it's the, it's the first right-hand turn uh, past Carly off of La Lawrence Hill Road. Uh, but it originally was associated with the houses on Carly. Right, it, the tower didn't move. Just yes. The yards, the property lines. <laughs> the moved. property lines uh, switched. And the, of course there's no tank on it, but uh, which gives it a little bit more height in the pictures. Uh, but, uh, um, it's still there and I think it's used as a playhouse. I, I don't know, at one point, I tried to stop and to put it on our house tour. I thought it would be an interesting house on the house tour, <laughs> but I never made contact with the owners. Hmm. All right, here's a comment from Geraldine. She says, my grandmother and great-grandmother were on the Greyhound team, Emily and Anna Nyberg. They lived on High Street. Oh, okay. I mean, the, the list of, uh, of the people on that sled are listed in the in the different papers. Uh, you know, it was, I think it was first introduced in uh, maybe the 1909, 1910 was the first time we saw the the Greyhound uh, come in. But uh, and of course it, it it had its claim to fame not only in the pictures around the country but uh, uh, in the big accident. Now, again, whether that caused the stop of the carnival, I suspect that the thousand gallons of water on Main Street uh, stopped it. And I think Prohibition had something to do with it too. Mm -hmm. And Prohibition made it, though there was a big crowd in 1920. And maybe they thought there was speakeasies around, I don't know. Or they knew of speakeasies. Yeah. Uh, Geraldine also said, oh my goodness, that little boy is my grandmother's brother. I'm not sure which photo that was, but that's amazing. What a great history you yeah, have, Geraldine. That's neat. Uh, we'll which little boy? Yeah, I mean, tell us which little boy. <laughs> I think it was in 1909. I saw the comment come through when I tried to make a note mentally of the photo, but now I can't recall. Geraldine, I, if you'll type that into the comments. 
um, if you remember what the what the photo was. Okay, um, Bruce asks, have you checked elapsed time against distance for average speeds? Yeah, didn't well, based I? Based on that, yeah, the 38 yeah, seconds. Right. And the course is half a mile, that would give you 47 miles an hour. They wrote one mile, but the course was- No, 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 the one mile, Robert, I think I've, I've discovered- oh, was the fetch? Was the record fetch. Fetch, ah, that's, that makes sense. That makes sense, uh, you know, because it didn't make any sense that the time course was one mile. You'd be going, what did you figure out? 96 miles an hour. 94 miles an hour. 94 <laughs> miles an hour on an average. <laughs> right. So, uh, so that confused us for a while, but then when I read, I, and I saw that the, uh, well, they commented when they went over the hill that the fetch was about a mile. And so I think, and that's what that referred to. So in, uh, in 14, they set the time record and the fetch record. All right, Geraldine uh, gave us further information. So I'll save that for the end so we can get through these questions. Did the Greyhound just flip or did it also hit a tree, which is why- Oh yeah, actually it does, it does say in the article that it, it swerved uh, and hit a tree in front of the St. Pat's Church. Okay, and then Joan asked, was anyone sued after the accident? Uh, I, I heard of no suit. It wasn't a litigious society <laughs> back then. <laughs> Different world 100 years ago. There should be a photograph of the accident because the photographers asked them to turn their heads. Yeah. yeah. All right. I've well, never seen one. I've never seen one either. I mean, in fact, I, I, I don't recall being seen a photograph of a turned over sled, and there were lots of them. I mean, there were, uh, uh, the, did I tell the story about how Michael uh, uh, Connell, I, I'm not sure, sure no, he did, did not. I forget. Uh, Michael cat. Connell, uh, uh, a cat had wandered across to, in one of the trial runs, and uh, Michael Connell uh, had to turn his sled sharply because he didn't want to kill the cat. Uh, and the cat uh, was certainly lucky to have his nine lives still, uh, but he flipped the sled over uh, mm -hmm. on that. And that was kind of one of the neat stories I meant to tell. And the other accident was once when uh, uh, one of the sleds got thrown off course there at that turn again, and they went and they ran into the Romano uh, delivery sled that uh, was uh, splintered. Uh, a horse-drawn sled was delivering groceries and there was a carton of eggs, they said in the article, uh, that flipped and only one egg was broken on the inside. So it was the luck of the carnival, as, as they <laughs> talked about. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. How were the Bettys attached to the sleds? Uh, they were bolted. Uh, the bolt went straight through so that the back sled didn't, uh, or secured so it couldn't turn because you didn't want you didn't want to have a rear end wobbling around up there. So you, you had to have that solidly attached to your, to your sled, but then you needed to rotate the others. And if you looked at some of those early Bettys, some of them uh, actually had uh, uh, two uh, washers almost that they turned on, uh, like, uh, and they were bolted through with a single axis, uh, you know, so it could turn. Okay, what other carnival activities did they have aside from bobsled races? Well, in the 1907 race, which was the first one, and they, it was really a local affair, they, uh, they, they somehow had a, a race of, uh, uh, of trotters. Uh, they, they, they had two horses that raced each other from, uh, I think, Woodbury Road to Wall Street. Uh, and they ran a couple of heats of those races. Uh, and then they had this big hog sitting in the Huntington Hotel and they had to guess its weight. <laughs> but after that, other than the, 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 uh, the races themselves and the uh, taverns being open and the crowds just in, enjoying Huntington as they still do today, or they used to uh, before a year ago happened, uh, and they still do today, actually. I don't enjoy them as much, unfortunately. But uh, um, so it, it, there doesn't seem to be much talk of other things other than the single sleds uh, races and the big bobs. Okay. Is there a list of the Green Lawn FD 
I imagine fire department bobsled members? Uh, I don't, I haven't run across uh, a list uh, of the Greenlawn sled. There may be because there were a number of the articles that did list the, uh, the people on each one of the sleds. Now, Greenlawn may, may know, uh, they may have a history of the, of the Greenlawn bobsled uh, that raced over here. Uh, I think it's funny that they spent some money to buy a, bring in a ringer from upstate New York and it, it, it failing miserably at the, in the Huntington course. And they went back to the, the hunched over. And Sherry, that's the Greenlawn Centerport Historical Society. They may have more information on that. That's the one you referenced. Okay. Um, and also someone mentioned you might want to check with the fire department. They may have archives and information on that also. Uh, all right, back to Geraldine. Uh, the little boy under the sign, it said crossing New York Avenue 1910. His name was Harold Mickey Nyberg. Mickey, I guess is a nickname. Oh, wow. So that, <laughs> that little boy right there. Which one now? The one closest to the, the right? sled or the little boy off to the right? Geraldine, if you want to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. That's amazing. I don't know, Geraldine, if we lost you. Yeah, he's the, the little sun. boy to little boy to the right. This one? With the, um, let's see, I'm losing my picture here. <laughs> the, the little boy right there. Yep, that's him. The far, oh, okay. far right. The far right. Okay, great. Yep, that's him. Did you write that down, Toby? Uh, no, but I, I hope uh, uh, Tracy. It. Okay, good, good. We'll <laughs> yeah, add that to the, what a, to the archives. Thank you. Yeah, but a thrill to see that. Thank you so much. One, one of the fascinating things I find on these pictures, and Robert did too, is is the dress. Is everybody leaving? Or what's happened? No, I <laughs> Robert, just stopped sharing. Oh. <laughs> We're still here. What about the dress? Well, how are everyone's dressed up. There weren't I mean, ties. You have bow ties, bowlers. Uh, we still don't see a picture, Robert. You, you, oh, you want, want me to share the screen? Yeah, I want. I, is everybody still here or are they all left? Yeah, no. we're still here. <laughs> if they're still here, they're yeah. hanging on your every word. Well, okay. We're all here. We're all here. <laughs> yeah, you're all ears. But I mean, you can flip through the some of them. I mean, you commented on it yourself. They were, uh, you know, look at those guys. I mean, they're all, uh, even some of the ones on the sled, some of them are seemingly uh, there, like those guys, <laughs> the Hirschfeld sled. Um, there was another one I'm looking for. Yeah. Keep talking. Well, okay, but uh, any more questions? Even pulling the sleds up, they had their hats on and their overcoats. Okay, I think that's it as far as questions. It looks like um, Joan mentioned she's never heard the word fetch before. Is that do you know, is that a term that applies to any other sport or is that specific? Uh, it's like actually that? a nautical term, I believe. I looked it up. Uh, I, in fact, I wrote about it. Uh, I mean, its basic meaning is to arrive at or a distance, mm -hmm. but it's used, it's used in, uh, in a nautical term is what's the earliest uh, definition of it. Uh, it's, it's also used in the sport of throwing a ball to a dog. <laughs> well, yeah, fetch means to bring it back, doesn't it? <laughs> In that respect. In that respect. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Here, here are some guys. Now, are those the well, of course, some of the younger kids have some kind of but, slotch houses, but they lose their ties. On. Ties. They're wearing ties, Best. bow ties. You know, this was a, a fancy town. This must have been on a Sunday. Yeah. No, oh, the races all were during the week. Never I, uh, I don't think I found any of them on the weekend, even a Saturday or a Sunday. And they would cancel school, let kids, you know, oh, go yeah. watch the carnival. I think so. Yeah. Maybe we yeah, should bring I mean, it back. How could you have in, uh, look at the green lawn. They're all dressed up too, or at least the, the hangers on are. 
Bruce says it's from sailing, which we mentioned. Yes, I thought so. Yeah, right. Such a mark. Um, Adrian asks, what does the name bobsled come from? If you huh? know. Uh, no, except I know that it means more than one, well, two sleds, the front and the back, because there are, there are bigger uh, sleds or sleighs almost that are bobsleds or bob sleighs in that case, I guess. I don't know. Um, but it, it certainly indicates two runners. Two runners, okay. Um, and then Betty says, thank you, it's been fascinating. She has some photos that were her grandfather, Leslie Peckham's. Mm -hmm. She was too young when he passed away to remember the info he told us, he told them. Good. We have a lot they, of information from Leslie Peckham. He's a great historian of Cold Spring Harbor. Oh really? I mean, if she has, do you? Uh, if she has bobsled races, she could scan and send us copies of. I'm, um, you know, they may, we may not have them. I mean, we have so many. There, we have many more than uh, we showed today. Really, we could have kept you here for another Dave. hour. <laughs> Betty, I'll get and any information on any other topic would be very welcome as well. Yes, or anybody who wants to do one of these. <laughs> yeah, if anybody's interested, that's true. Toby, um, I want to know where does the word bob come from? Well, the bobsled, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I honestly don't, other than the fact that I know it always refers to the fact that you have two separated runners. That would um, be bob and sled, but where does bob come from? Short for Robert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I don't think the bobsled two words meant Bob was anything other than to indicate that it's a sled, but it's not a single sled. Now, I don't know what, uh, that would be a good question for Google. Well, Bob, Betty, Mary, it all. Yeah, <laughs> right. Me well, Mary was the name of his sister, so I got that one. And Dorothy, I think, was the name of the wife. But um, I don't know where Betty comes from either, why they're called Bettys. Uh, Patricia says it was originally used for hauling timber. The bobsled was. I yeah, I, I mean, there are works. The work sleds would have two runners on them at times. Uh, you know, and they would be long, I guess. And, and the, the concept would be the same. You wouldn't want the back runners to turn. Mm -hmm. um, but you could pull them in. The, if you, you could probably, the front runners would follow the horse that was drawing the big sled. Yeah, actually, I think we do have a work sled that is a bobsled up in the rafters of the of the barn. Oh. All right, Geraldine says she'd like to come down to the society and bring some pictures of the Nyberg family. We would love that, Geraldine. Oh, that would be touch. fabulous. Yeah. In touch with you about that. Um, Patricia said she got that from Google. Oh, wait, here we go. It's it. The body of the sled rested on short bobs, one behind the other. So, sounds like that's where the name maybe came from. So they, they called them bobs rather than Betty's? <laughs> I, I had always been told uh, the, lo the Locust uh, Valley people. I mean, uh, Robert and I interviewed uh, Zeb Wilson, who owned the 1911 and built it. Uh, I, I'm sure he's probably passed away now. but. Uh, he called them Betty's. Hmm. And, maybe, uh, maybe it's like a regional. Yeah, could name. be. Uh, a couple of people are Googling for us now and they're saying, uh, Betty says the etymology, the name is derived from the action some early competitors adopted of bobbing back and forth inside their sleds to increase speed, I imagine. Uh, originated in 1839. Hmm. <laughs> We're learning so much today. Yes. Thanks for our researchers. All right, that looks like the end of our questions. Thank you everyone so, so much yes, for joining you. us. Yeah. This was thanks great and so nice to see so many people who are have relations in these photos. That's wonderful. And we'll get in touch to maybe learn a little more if we can. All right, well, I wish you a lovely afternoon and a nice weekend and hopefully we'll see you next month. I'll send this recording out as soon as I have it uploaded to everyone who registered. All right. Thanks again. All right. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. See you next bye -bye. time.